And what book have we been studying? I didn't hear you. Second okay, Second Corinthians. Have you learned anything from Second Corinthians? Anybody? Couple things. We started on this adventure. Uh, I'm trying to remember. I didn't look back at my records, but I think it was May. Back when we started Second Corinthians. So we've been plowing through this book. Starting in May, all through the summer, into the fall, and up till today. And today we find ourselves at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, which is where we're going to finish up. Okay, uh, the book of 2 Corinthians. So it's been a long journey, but hopefully it's been a helpful one. And uh, hopefully you've learned a lot through this book. And uh, in my Bible, uh, I don't know, sometimes Bibles have headings and sometimes they don't. But in my Bible, the heading for chapter 13 says, Final Warnings. Mm. That sounds like fun, right? Mm. <laughs> Final Warnings. And so that's uh, interesting because there's been a lot of things in this letter where Paul has warned his church about. Do you realize the church has an enemy? Mm -hmm. Right? An evil enemy called the devil. And there's uh, lots of things that work against the church. Lots of things that try to corrupt the church from being something other than the holy bride of Christ. And so it's appropriate that Paul has final warnings uh, amongst a letter full of many warnings for his church. So let's read um, chapter 13 here. And we're going to go through verses uh, 1 through 14, and then uh, see what Paul has to say to us as final warnings. Everybody got that passage? Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. This will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. No, I, I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while absent. Mm -hmm. On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier or any of the others. Since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power, we will live with him to serve you. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not do any wrong. Not that people will see that we have stood the test, but that you will do what is right, even though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong. And our prayer is for your perfection. This is why I write these things when I am absent, that when I come, I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority. The authority the Lord gave me for building you up, not for tearing you down. Finally, brothers, goodbye. Aim for perfection. Listen to my appeal. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So as Paul brings us into the final 
section of his letter to the Corinthians here. We can see here, just as we have noticed through the rest of the letter, that this is, in fact, a very serious letter that Paul has written to us with many warnings. So chapter 13 might be the final warning, but all through this letter, Paul has given us many warnings. You'll notice in the very first couple of verses there of chapter 13, Paul's tone is kind of uh, like somebody is fighting against him, right? And he has to kind of answer those people that are fighting against him. So he says there, beginning in verse 1 again, this will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. So you see, Paul has been ministering to this church in Corinth. And uh, as you notice, as you read through the books of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, this was not the church that was uh, missing many of the problems that are possible in this church, right? I think they pretty much experienced each and every type of problem and difficulty and opposition and uh, uh, enemies as any church could. And so Paul is addressing this in a very serious way, right? I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while absent. On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier or any of the others, since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. He is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. So Paul is claiming the authority of Christ to answer his critics, to answer those who are working against the true church, those who are uh, false teachers, and many things like that. So notice he's not a wimpy guy, right? He says, I will not spare those who sinned. So when Paul shows up, I have a feeling that there were certain people in the church that were not exactly thrilled about his visit, hmm. right? Because he was going to take care of business, whatever it took. But notice, in this passage, he talks about this idea of weakness and power uh, down here in verse 4. But back up, remember a couple weeks ago, we looked at chapter 12, and Paul talked about power and weakness. In chapter 12, uh, verses 9 and 10, he says, uh, talking about when the Lord appeared to him, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now that statement doesn't make any sense at all, does it? Mm -hmm. How can power be made perfect in weakness? Isn't power the opposite of weakness? Isn't weakness the opposite of power? You know, but, you see, the kingdom of God is this topsy-turvy thing. Or it's not exactly like the kind of thing that the world understands. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. This is the words of Jesus. For Jesus' power is made perfect in weakness. That's good news, isn't it? I remember I asked, anybody here have any weakness? <laughs> now, I got lots of that going on, okay? But guess what? Christ's power can still be made perfect no matter how weak you are. Because it's not about the power of our human flesh. It's about the power of God's Holy Spirit working through us because of what Christ has done for us. So Paul says, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That can be true of each and every one of us, that Christ's power can rest on us and work through us. So Paul says, this is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulties. Okay, so the next time you experience weaknesses, everybody say, oh, that's lots of fun. <laughs> How about insults? I always enjoy when people insult me, right? <laughs> How about hardships? That's what we pray for. Oh, God, please send me some hardships, because life's <laughs> going so good right now. <laughs> Ever pray for that? I don't. No, I don't think so. I'm not crazy. How about persecutions? How about 
difficulties. You see, these are the things that, in a worldly way, none of us wants. But we all live in a world, don't we? Where we experience all these things. Insults, and hardships, and weaknesses, and persecutions, and difficulties. The good news is, Christ's power can overcome all those things. Paul says, for when I am weak, weak in the worldly way, then I am strong, strong in the way of Christ's power working through me. So he says something similar to that in verse 4 of chapter 13. He says, For to be sure, he, Christ, was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power we will live with him to serve you. Christ's power is the answer. But what do we need in order to have Christ's power? We need to have genuine faith in Christ for Christ's power to work through us. So Paul wants to make sure that these people have a genuine faith. So when you get to verse 5, he gives one of these pretty uh, kind of unpleasant warnings, a little bit uncomfortable. Right? When you look at what he says in verse 5 about examining yourself. Right? Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Examine yourself. Pretty important, right? Notice it. You examine yourself. Remember what it says back there in the Gospels, the great commandment, right? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourselves. So we're supposed to love our neighbor and examine ourselves. What happens a lot in our humanness? We kind of do the reverse, don't we? We love ourselves and examine our neighbor. Don't we? Well, I can tell you everything that's wrong with my neighbor. Let me give you a list right here. <laughs> okay? But me, I'm wonderful. I'm perfect. I'm awesome. You know? That's kind of how we see things in the humanness, don't we? We love ourselves and we examine everybody else to pick out all their faults. But isn't Paul saying the exact opposite thing here? Again, see, we've got to grow to a certain place in our faith to really embrace this, right? So Paul says, examine yourself. Love your neighbor. Don't examine your neighbor. Examine yourself. See what might be wrong inside of you. See where you might be failing to live up all, to all that God has called you to experience. So Paul says in verse 6, and I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. We have to test ourselves, examine ourselves. So what do we use to examine ourselves? In what way might we be looking to see if our faith is genuine? Well, when we get into the next section here, we see Paul uses this another word, Right, as part of his final warnings, that we don't like very well. A word that kind of causes us to cringe a little bit and kind of run away from. It. Because in this passage, Paul uses this very challenging phrase. He says, aim for perfection. Aim for perfection. Oh, wait a second, preacher. That's kind of crazy, isn't it? Perfection? Nobody's perfect, right? Well, that's true. But that's not answering what Paul is saying here, is it? Paul says, aim for perfection. In verse 9 he says, We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong. Our prayer is for your perfection. And then in verse 11, Finally, brothers, goodbye. Aim for perfection. Listen to my appeal. Be of one mind. 
live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Well, there's one place we could examine ourselves to see if we are aiming for perfection. Paul says, be of one mind, live in peace. How easy is that? How perfect are we in that regard? How are we doing at being of one mind and living in peace? Think about your family. Just start there. Is your family in a place of perfect peace hmm. in the way they get along with each other? Hmm. Okay, we're just getting started. Hmm. <laughs> okay, now let's look at our neighborhood. Are we living in peace with all of our neighbors? Everybody hmm. in our community? Hmm. All the other wonderful people in church? <laughs> right? Be of one mind, live in peace. Might sound like it's too much to ask for, but what does Paul say? Aim for that. Aim for it. Don't give up striving for that. The idea is don't shoot for 50%, half so, whatever is good enough. Not 90%, not 99%. Paul says aim for perfection. Has that been our theme through the whole book of Corinthians? Remember what our theme verse is, right? Go back to 2 Corinthians 3. And uh, verse 18, that's our theme verse. Take a look at that. And this is the theme verse <coughs> that we've had all through the book. This is the goal of the Christian faith. So that we, with unveiled faces, might all reflect the Lord's glory. Because that's why we're aiming for perfection. Because we want to reflect the Lord's glory. Is the Lord perfect? Mm -hmm. Is the Lord full of love and peace and all those good attributes? We're supposed to reflect that to everybody else in our lives, right? We want to reflect the Lord's glory. We're being transformed into His likeness. It's talking about Jesus, the likeness of Christ, with ever-increasing glory. We're being transformed into the image of Christ, or the likeness of Christ. So when Paul says aim for perfection, that's what he's talking about. Because our goal is to look just like Jesus to everybody around us. So Paul says, aim for that. Jesus is perfect. Aim to be just like Jesus. Looking like Jesus in every area of our life. And that's really what Paul has focused on all through this book. So I'm going to go back through the book a little bit. I'm going to pick out a couple of highlight verses that say exactly like that. That the idea of this aiming for perfection is the idea of aiming to look like Jesus in every area of our life. So I'll just go back one more chapter in chapter 2 and look at verse 9. Paul says this, The reason I wrote you, that's the letter that we just got done studying here this morning, that we've been through all summer. The reason that I wrote to you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. There's a lot of commandments in the Bible, right? But God only really expects us to be obedient to 67% of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Well, no. Sorry. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> I wrote to see if you would stand the test, remember, test yourselves, examine yourselves, and be obedient and everything. You know what? Paul means it. God means it. He wants us to be obedient and everything. That's what it means to aim for perfection. Look at chapter 3. Look at verses 2 and 3. This is a wonderful picture. So you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show, this is all followers of Christ, you show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human 
hearts. You see, our lives are a letter to the world. You want to know what Jesus looks like? Look at me. That's what it's supposed to be. Hmm. You are the letter to your neighbor. So if it's not a nice letter, then that's what Jesus looks like to them. Because when somebody says, well, I'm a follower of Christ, but acts like a jerk, you make Jesus look like that. That's the kind of letter that people read. What kind of letter should they be reading? The one where Jesus looks pretty awesome, full of love and compassion and things like that. Go to chapter 4. Look at verses 5 through 7. The wonderful picture we see there about what it means to aim for perfection. Chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. For we, we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So part of what it means to aim for perfection is you make yourself a servant to all people. Servants for Jesus' sake. Verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, as quoted in Genesis chapter 1, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But then here's where we come in. Verse 7. But we, as followers of Christ, have this treasure. What's the treasure? The Holy Spirit of Christ within us. We have this treasure in jars of clay. Okay, so you're the jar of clay in, in that verse, okay? To show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. See, again, there's that power that's made perfect in our weakness. The Holy Spirit of God within us is a treasure in a jar of clay. He is the treasure, we're the jar. But we can really make him look good if we're aiming for perfection as that jar. Look at chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. So we make it our goal to please him. I thought we were supposed to please the boss. Well, you should do that too. Okay, if you can. Well, who's even more important than the boss? We make it our goal to please him, talking about Christ, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. And again, remember, this is a very serious letter. Many warnings in this letter. Verse 10 is one of them. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the same son while in the body, whether good or bad. That's why we're aiming for perfection. Because any way that we fail to live up to the image and character of Christ, there's going to come a day where we're going to stand before Jesus and we're going to give account for everything done while in the body, whether good or bad. I should put the fear of the Lord in here, right? For everything done, whether good or bad. Look also at chapter 5. Verses 14 and 15. This is also how we aim for perfection. It says, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, as Jesus died for all of us, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Okay, anybody here living? Okay, if you're not living, raise your hand. All right. Wrong answer, right? Hmm. Okay, so you all qualify here, right? Those who live should no longer live for themselves. Remember what I told you about? Examine yourself, love your neighbor, not the other way around. No longer live for yourself, but for him who died. That's Jesus. That's what it means to aim for perfection. That's what Christ expects from us. Skip down to chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Okay, you realize the position of an ambassador is a high honor. If you get called on to be an ambassador for your country, that's a high honor. And everything that 
everything you do represents the country that you are the ambassador of. It says there that we are Christ's ambassadors. How would you like it if one of the ambassadors of the United States of America to a really important country that we want to be good friends with was some kind of a jerk, you know? And the ambassador goes over to the farm country and he dresses like a bomb and he's drunk and he acts like a goofball and he meets the prime minister of the country or the president or the good leader or whatever. He says, hey dude, what's up? You're looking kind of goofy today. Is that how you want your ambassador to act in another country that represents you? Would you pick that kind of an ambassador for your country? Mm -mm. I don't think so. Paul says we are Christ's ambassadors. We should be aiming for perfection, you say. As though God were making his appeal for, through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. Because God made him, who had no sin, as Jesus, to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You catch that? So that in him, in Christ, our faith in him, so that we might become the righteousness of God. That's a high calling. So Paul says, aim for perfection, to be the best ambassador that you can. Skip down to chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Paul gives some of the attributes of what the character of a Christian looks like if they're aiming for perfection. He says it's in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness. Everybody doing good with these so far? <laughs> right? And the Holy Spirit, and sincere love, and truthful speech, and the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left. Just some more words describe the character of a person aiming for perfection. Skip down a little bit further in chapter 6. Pick it up in verse 14 there. You know, as that Paul talks about how important it is if we're aiming for perfection, so talk about the pure bride of Christ. That means that we have to be careful who we hang out with and what kind of life we're living because it all reflects on the character of Christ. So starting in verse 14 of chapter 6, Paul says, don't be yoked together with unbelievers. It doesn't mean you don't talk to unbelievers. It doesn't mean you don't relate to them in some way. But when it talks about being yoked together, it's like a marriage or an important covenant relationship. It's somebody that you're doing uh, like in some kind of a ministry with. Right? So you can't do ministry with an unbeliever. They're opposites. What harmony is there between Christ and Goliath? Another name for the devil, Goliath. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? The answer is obvious, nothing. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? None. And then he portrays who we are in Christ. For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, I will be their God, and they will be my people. That's a high calling. So Paul says, aim for perfection in that calling. Verse 17. Therefore come out from them, and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Verse, chapter 7, verse 1 then. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit. And here's this word again. Perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. So Paul must be pretty serious about this idea, about aiming for perfection. Perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Purifying ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit. 
Because there's a lot of things that can contaminate our body and spirit. Have you ever eaten bad food? Eaten? What's the right word here? Sorry. Wrong grammar. Is it eaten? How do you say that? Eaten. 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 Is that right? Eight. You know what I mean anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. have you ever had to eat any like bad food that actually was bad and it made you sick? Right. Have you ever done that? Mm-hmm. It's pretty gruesome, right? Yes. <laughs> Purify yourself from everything that contaminates the body. So if I said, here's some spoiled food, would you like some? What would you say? <laughs> no, because you don't want to be puking up your guts later on, right? <laughs> Same thing goes with our spirit. Purifying yourself from everything that contaminates body and spirit. Why? Because we're aiming for perfection. We're perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. But that's serious business. Skip over to chapter 10. And look at verses 3 through 6. Remember, we focused on this the one Sunday. This is part of what's involved, this idea of aiming for perfection and purifying ourselves. Chapter 10, verses 3 through 6. Paul says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they, they being proper spiritual weapons, Christian character, prayer, the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, those are the weapons that we're talking about. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. Strongholds of the devil. Spiritual things that are out of order. Right? That's the idea of perfecting holiness, of aiming for perfection. How do we do that? Continue reading. Verse 5 says, We demolish arguments, Everything, every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Because there are evil spirits all over the place that lie and deceive people and try to lead them down the wrong road. So we demolish those things. Every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. But we have to do it one thought at a time. Because the devil will try to deceive us up here to get us thinking wrong. Wrong actions start with wrong thoughts, don't they? So that's why it says we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So when there's a thought that comes into our head that says, you know what? You should go steal your neighbor's car. Hmm. Where does that thought come from? Take a guess. Hello? Anybody else? Devil. Okay. So we get a thought in our head. You know what? You should go rape the girl down the street. Where's that thought come from? Devil. Okay. You get the idea, right? But that's where sin starts, doesn't it? It's an evil thought in our head. Yep. Yep. But then we take that thought captive and we say, that's the devil. I rebuke you, devil. I'm not listening to that thought. Get out of here. Okay, but what if we get a thought in our head that says, look at that poor person over there. They're really struggling. Go help them. Think that thought might be from God? There's a person over there weeping in that hospital. I think you should go over and pray for them. Where's that thought come from? See, that's why we take the wrong thoughts captive, so that our head could be filled with God's thoughts. Because if we got it all clouded up with a bunch of crap, then there's not room for God to come in and start speaking to us. But if we clean out the crap, you see, if we take captive the bad thoughts, and we start focusing on the things of God, pursuing the character of God, aiming for perfection, perfecting holiness out of reverence for Christ, then our brains become the thing where God can speak into to compel us to change the world, right? That's why we take every thought captive, to make it obedient to Christ. But it's serious business. Look what Paul says in the very next verse. 
and that I'll be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. See, we're aiming for perfection, aren't we? Look at chapter 11 and verse 2. This is a picture of what Paul says the church should look like. He says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promise you to one husband, to Christ. So the, the church is pictured as the bride of Christ here, you see. I promise you to one husband, to Christ, so that I may present you as a pure virgin to him. Wow. That's quite a picture, isn't it? What if somebody went to Christ and said, hey, I got a woman for you. I mean, she's been a prostitute for the last 12 years, but you'll like her. Hmm. Would that be an appropriate present to give to Christ? Mm -mm. He wants a pure bride, doesn't he? That's why we're aiming for perfection, brothers and sisters. Christ wants a pure bride. See, spiritual power is made perfect in that weakness of our flesh. Look at chapter 12 and verse 9 again. Paul says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So when it comes to the idea of aiming for perfection, we all recognize that we naturally have weaknesses to accomplish that. But guess what? It's not about our strength. It's about the strength of Christ within us as we yield ourselves to Him. His power is made perfect. Our human weakness and His power combined to make us able to become people as the Holy Bride of Christ. That's why we aim for perfection. So the question is, for each and every one of us to answer today. Just remember, it says, examine yourselves, not your neighbors. So the question is this. In your life right now, and in your walk of faith, what are you aiming for? What are you aiming for? Perfection? 50% so-so? 90%? Or to be just like Jesus? Full of his character, full of his love, an ambassador to reach the world for Christ. What are you aiming for? I can tell you what I'm aiming for. I want to do the best I can. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. I want to be the best person I could be for Jesus. So we'll finish up with these last couple of verses in chapter 13. Finally, brothers, goodbye. Aim for perfection. Listen to my appeal. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints send their greetings. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you this morning for the word of God. We thank you, Father, for this letter that has been preserved that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. Father, we recognize that there are many truths in this letter that apply to us today. And Father, we want to be people who are aiming for perfection, not people who are aiming for a 50% half so-so. I just want to be just barely good enough. We don't want to be those kind of people, Father, because we recognize that Christ is looking for a pure and holy bride. He's looking for people that might look just like him, to represent him to this world. Father, I pray that each and every one of us would examine ourselves, take a look deep within our hearts, 
to see any area where we might be falling short, any area where we're something less than the perfection of Christ's likeness. Any thought that we have to take captive, Father, give us your power to overcome the enemy. We know that the enemy is working overtime to tempt us to do anything other than to be people like Jesus. But Father, for your power, you can be made perfect even up through our weakness. And you can do amazing things through your power, even though we are people who are weak in many ways. Father, take the efforts that we bring to you. Empower them with your Holy Spirit. And Father, do great things among us and in this world. Father, we want to see the world turn to faith in Jesus. And they will do that if they look at us and see an example of Jesus in us, in our character, in our words, in the type of people that we are to the people around us. Father, do that good work in each and every one of us. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Now one more sign of Jesus.